Hello, welcome to the lecture on consciousness. So, in the earlier segment of this lecture, so we talked about the link between stimulus and awareness. In fact, throughout the lecture, we never talked about uh, how the experience, the, the conscious experience that the stimulus creates. We only talked about the responses in the brain, right? Which part responds to vision, which part responds to auditory stimuli, and things like that. We never really consulted the subject, the experiencer, right? We never brought the experiencer into the picture. So, in this lecture, we, we began to do that in the first segment. But in the first segment, we only talked about this kind of a variable, variable relationship between the stimulus and the experience that it creates. So, for example, we had given some examples of color perception. So, color we know from physics is rigorously defined by the frequency of the, of the light, the, wave, the wave, frequency or wavelength of the light. We have seen examples in the previous lecture where the color, color perception varies a lot and from person to person. It can depend upon the lighting, it can depend upon the context and it can depend upon whether you are seeing the original image or its uh, after image and so on and so forth. So, there is a lot of variability that comes in when you introduce consciousness. So, we got a bit of feel of that in the first segment. So, this segment we now look at uh, neural substrates. So, uh, what happens in the brain when uh, this kind of a variations in consciousness or conscious interpretations of stimuli occur? Let us begin with a curious experiment called the rubber hand experiment. So, in this experiment, the subject uh, sits on a table, both the hands are you know placed on the table like this, uh, palm down. And so, in this case, uh, this lady, uh, her left hand is actually behind that white screen and what you are seeing, with what looks like her left hand, which is right in front of the white screen is actually a toy hand, a dummy hand, it is just a rubber hand. Only thing is, it is designed so that her actual hand, her actual right hand and her this kind of a dummy model of the left hand both look very similar. And the screen is placed such that uh, the lady cannot see the see her actual left hand, which is behind the screen. And you see, the experiment is actually touching with both his hands. Uh, with his left hand, is touching the rubber hand, which is placed in front of the woman. And with his right hand, is touching the actual left hand of that subject, the woman. So now the experimenter actually starts stroking the rubber hand, which the, she can see, which the subject can see. And also her, her actual left hand, which she cannot see, but she cannot, she can feel. So her brain is actually receiving two stimuli: the the visual feedback from the rubber hand, which looks like her left hand, and as the person stroked the hand, she can see that. Okay, and then the somatosensory or touch feedback from her actual left hand, which is behind the screen, which is also touched by the same person and stroked. Now this stroking now has a pattern. Now he is stroking two hands: one rubber hand, one real hand. He makes sure that the stroking is done in the same way. The rhythm or the pattern of stroking uh, is identical uh, with, the, with both these hands, with the rubber hand and the real hand. So as this happens, like for a minute or so, right, and then the subject starts feeling that the rubber hand is actually her own hand. She starts identifying herself uh, with that rubber hand, and she, she, she starts like owning it up. She starts, uh, you know, she starts imagining, the, imagining that it's part of her uh, her body. I know in one experiment, which is slightly dramatic, they actually took a hammer and tried to bang on the rubber hand, and the subject jumped up in alarm, thinking that you know she is going to get hurt, but it's only the rubber hand. So the identification is so deep. So what is happening here? You know, can we rationalize this and explain what's going on? So the subject's brain is receiving input, uh, visual input from the rubber hand, and the touch input from her actual hand, and both these inputs are actually uh, similar. The patterns are similar. So now there is this theory that right brain tries to uh, identify objects and uh, the right <laughs> based on their attributes using uh, what is called feature binding. So look at this simple question. So I am looking at this red cricket ball. Its color is red and it's uh, round in shape, right? So both are visual properties. So now imagine there is a region in the in the brain, the visual cortex of the person. Uh, so let's say A, and then there is some firing pattern in response to the roundness of this object and the, the firing of these neurons represent round, the property round. There is another region B where the firing represents color and this particular firing pattern represents red. So now the brain should know that both these properties correspond to the same object, they belong to the same object. So because any object is basically a combination of certain properties, the basic properties could be very small, not very large in number. But uh, different objects come with uh, different combinations of properties you know, in terms of color, shape and so on. So, how does the brain know that both these colors 
uh, both these properties represent the same object, they are associated with the same object. So, the feature binding by synchronous firing this theory says that the, these two sets of neurons one representing the round the shape property of the object another representing the color property of the object they actually fire in synchrony. So, therefore, if you look at uh, you know these two pools of neurons in different parts of the brain and record from them the fact that both are firing in sync tells you that both neurons are talking about the same object. So, basically the integrity of the object is interpreted uh, by synchronizing in the time domain. So, basically what this theory says is if you are looking at an object and uh, you know you are looking at different uh, aspects of the object right and these different as aspects you know they activate different parts of the brain. So, all those different activities represent the same object. So, therefore, they fire in sync. So, therefore, they will show synchronized or correlated neural activity. So, when different pools of neurons which respond to the same object or different properties of the same object if they fire in synchrony or show correlated activity then you perceive the subject perceives that all those neurons uh, are looking at the same object are interpreting the same object. So, the oneness of the object is interpreted by the brain by translating it or coding it in terms of synchronized activity of neurons. So, correlation implies identity. So, just look at what is happening in the rubber hand uh, experiment. So, the, the, the experiment is so kind of cunningly designed so that the pattern of visual feedback you know the movements of the finger of the experimenter and the pattern of the somatosensory feedback or the stroking pattern of the experimenter on the real hand both are identical. So, therefore, the corresponding neural response to both these stimuli some in the different parts of the brain also are probably identical. Right. So, therefore, the person is interpreting that both these stimuli are coming from the same object her actual hand so which, which was a mistake because normally it does not happen right you never have a situation where right some replica of your hand is uh, stroked and then uh, right and then your real hand is also stroked in the same way that kind of thing you know this is here it is experimentally created in a very cunning way, but that does not happen normally. So, that kind of a false correlations do not arise in real real life experience, but in this they are creating that kind of a false correlation that false correlation is creating a false identity a false interpretation of identity ok. So, basically by tampering with the correlations in among neural activities you can tamper with the way we perceive the world with the way we interpret objects in the world ok. So, now this is a theory, but uh, and <coughs> but is there any experimental evidence for this theory. So, uh, people have uh, found that uh, so this kind of a correlated activity particularly happens in a certain frequency band. So, whenever you are talking about synchronization two neurons are firing they are you know for them to be synchronized they have to be oscillatory they have to have some firing they have to fire at some frequency and then they sync at that frequency. The brain has many frequencies I mean if you take an EEG or ultrasensophorogram of a brain you will find that the spectrum of the signal has multiple bands. So, some of the more important bands that you find in EEG are shown in this figure. So, there is a gamma band which goes from 31 to 100 hertz then there is a beta band which goes from 16 to 30 hertz. The alpha band uh, which is seen when you are in a quiet meditative state uh, is uh, between 8 to 15 hertz the theta band from 4 to 7 hertz and delta which is generally seen in uh, deep sleep right uh, is from 0.1 to 3 hertz. So, now it, it turned out that there is some evidence that when, when you are looking at an object or multiple properties of the object is are being responded to by different parts of the brain neurons that respond to all these properties fire in synchrony in the gamma band. Uh, so, in fact, some of the pioneering work on this uh, topic was done by a German uh, lab uh, headed by you know uh, Engels and Gray and Singer and you know Koenig and others. So, what they, they, they performed, performed an experiment with cats you know cats visual cortex. The, so, they presented a moving bar of a given orientation to the cat and we know that in the visual system you have this uh, neurons which respond to oriented bars and also some neurons respond to oriented bar moving in a given direction. So, they found uh, they measured from neurons uh, in different parts of the visual cortex of the cat which respond to the <coughs> moving bar and they found that all those neurons show synchronization in the gamma band. Okay, so, that was a major discovery. So, the kind of ideas that have been floating around in fact, this idea was first uh, proposed by van der uh, Malsberg uh, Christoph van der Malsberg. And that idea turned out to be true, and this kind of a feature binding by synchronization seems to be true. And there is you know this effort to uh, discover more and more examples, more and more evidence for that kind of a feature binding. But that still only talks about object identity. How do we understand an object uh, by combining and assembling its various properties? How do you understand that? 
all the properties of the object are actually in associated with the same object. How do you understand or encode object integrity? But that does not say anything about the object's perception. How do you see the object? How do you experience the object? It does not say anything about that. So, here is where there is a uh, theoretical leap that was uh, you know uh, performed. Uh, it was proposed by you know Francis Crick uh, in what is called the astonishing hypothesis. What Crick had suggested is that uh, gamma band synchronization subserves not only object identity which is what you have discussed, but also consciousness. So, that means unless the activity becomes synchronized <coughs> in the gamma band, it does not enter consciousness and whenever it is synchronized, that is when you become aware of it. Okay, is there any evidence for that? So, the study by uh, Lucia Meloni and colleagues, they presented a stimulus uh, to a subject and uh, the thing is when the subject is uh, presented with a short stimulus, a brief stimulus, then you can find that the that the brain is responding to it, you can see it in EEG, you can see it in at single neuron level also. But if it is too brief then subject uh, shows no evidence of uh, sensory awareness of that stimulus. But when you present it for a longer time right, you will see that there is a synchronized activity across a large uh, spatial scales right in the brain. So, there is a long range uh, transient synchronization in the EEG in the gamma range when the patient was conscious. And contrarily right in, psych in psychiatric conditions like you know schizophrenia, Parkinson's, autism, epilepsy, this kind of a synchronization is uh, somewhat weaker. So, there are deficits in this kind of synchronization. So, the synchronization has some correlate with your you know conscious experience of the stimulus. And a very interesting set of experiments have been uh, done by Benjamin Libet on what is called subjective timing. So, we talked about uh, the fact that are you conscious or not when you present a stimulus what does it take to become conscious? So, we just said that unless stimulus is presented for a sufficiently long time, you do not become conscious of it. So, that is a basic condition for you to become something conscious. Uh, but uh, the other interesting question is, when do you become conscious? So, I, I present a stimulus to you, right, at uh, no, exactly at what time do you become conscious of that? And here you have some very interesting results that emerged from the studies of Benjamin Leibert. So, the thing is uh, in this studies, so the actually the cortex of the subject is patient is exposed and you can know they put electrodes on the cortex and electrically stimulate the cortex. So, they in initially play with, uh, so the current, the current is passed into the cortex and the current pulses, right. The current amplitude and the current frequency and the pulse duration, these are uh, varied. And uh, this the search for what is the minimum condition, right, that it, what, what is, what is minimum stimulus, minimal stimulus that it takes to produce consciousness in the subject. So, what they found is even if your current intensity is slightly lesser in the present same train of pulses, sequence of pulses for a longer duration, right, the person becomes conscious. But thing is there is a minimum that you need, uh, minimum current level that you need for the person to be conscious. And uh, at that minimum you have to present it for a sufficient, sufficient duration. So, this minimal stimulus, right, present to the, to the cortex uh, which produces the conscious experience in the subject, uh, this uh, Benjamin Libet calls it the liminal one. And at this minimum current intensity, you have to present the stimulus for about 0.5 seconds, right, uh, for the subject to be conscious of the stimulus. Okay, so so thing is, so if you so so what is interesting is when you, ex, you know, uh, stimulate the cortex, you need to stimulate it for nearly half a second before you find uh, that the subject feels that stimulus, the effect of the stimulus. But what is interesting is what happens when you actually give a peripheral stimulus. So suppose you are stimulating somebody's sensory cortex, so right? When you stimulate it directly in the cortex, then you feel that somebody is touching some part of the brain, depending upon where you are stimulating. So let us say I am touching, I am stimulating the kind of a middle finger part of the somatic sensory cortex, and when I stimulate there, you subject will feel that uh, his or her middle finger is being touched. Now I, in other experiment, I actually touch the middle finger, and then I ask, when does the subject become conscious of the stimulus? So, if you directly stimulate the cortex, you know, right, it takes about half a second for the person to be conscious of it, right? And then cortex is right there. I mean, your brain, your mind, you would think is right here in, inside the brain somewhere, and your, you would think that the hand is far off from your brain, so it's much farther from your mind. And therefore, if you stimulate the hand, you would, would, should take longer for it to enter your conscious awareness. But the results are different. Okay, let us see what happens in an actual experiment. So, here we have defined five quantities, uh, C indicates cortex and S indicates uh, stimulus or skin stimulus given to superficially and object uh, represents objective world. So, the, the time, so T C 
a subscript object means, so the time at which the stimulation is given to the cortex, so that is in the objective world and that you can measure with your clocks and stuff. Then T c uh, sub is the time at which the cortex stimulus is felt in the subjective world. Uh, so then, so the, so the gap between the T c of j and T c sub, that means time at which you begin your stimulation, time at which the subject feels that he has felt the stimulation, uh, the, the effect of the cortical stimulation is about half a millisecond. This is what you can see in the, uh, so the, the middle line, you see that middle line. Now there are three more uh, time quantities, T s of and T s sub, that is the time at which the skin is stimulated in the objective world and the time at which the subject feels that the stimulus is received in the subjective world, that because, because that is something the subject alone knows. And then there is a third thing which is the T s sub but expected, you know, when do you think the stim, the skin stimulus would reach the subjective, you know, the subject, uh, this, the subjective conscious awareness of the person. So, normally what you would think is, uh, when the cortical stimulation is given, the gap between the T c object and T c sub is about half a second. So, you would think that same thing gets carried over even when you stimulate uh, the finger or the skin, actually you would think that it will take, take even longer. But, uh, you know, uh, quite paradoxically, the T s sub is actually very close to the T s of, that means the time at which they feel <coughs> the stimulus is received is actually much uh, quicker uh, than what is expected. So, that means if you summarize this result, when you stimulate the brain directly, stimulate the cortex directly, it takes much longer for the stimulus to enter the consciousness, that is you, the conscious self. But when you stimulate the skin, is entering the conscious self much quicker, actually it takes only a few tens of milliseconds compare that with 500 milliseconds you know, for the cortical stimulation. So, first of all one big question that arises uh, in interpreting these kinds of experiments is, how do you measure something like subjective time? For example, I have a thought, you know, I have a thought that you know, I want to go and drink some water and that thought occurs at certain time. Now, how do you time it? I mean I cannot compare the thought with some clock and you know how do you do that? So, what the, the experiment what they have done is the subject is shown a dial on which there is a dot moving round and round that uh, he has received that stimulus, you know, he has felt that stimulus. So, at that point he looks at this dial and sees where the dot is on that on the screen on the dial and then he remembers that location because since the dot is not moving very fast kind of the, the subject can remember the location of the dot with reasonable accuracy and that is given to the experimenter later and then they average this over many many trials. And that is how you time the subjective event, okay. This, 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 these are subjective timing experiments, okay. So, so therefore, uh, when you stimulate the finger or the skin, right, uh, it actually reaches the consciousness much quicker than when you stimulate the cortex. Benjamin Leibert has a very interesting interpretation of why this is happening. He calls this a subjective referral backwards in time. So, basically, what he is saying is like, you know, when brain knows that when you give a stimulus for it to reach the conscious self it is anyway going to take uh, 500 milliseconds or half a second, this happens all the time. So, uh, if I want to more accurately judge when the stimulus has occurred, may as well introduce a correction all the time, so that I am better off right in uh, determining exactly when the event has happened. So, your conscious self or you know your brain is making this correction all the time, right when you when you get stimulus from outside from the through the regular natural channels of sensory stimulus. But then a brain does not normally get stimulated directly in the cortex, I mean that is a unnatural thing which has begun only recently. So, brain does not do this correction when you do cortical stimulation, but when you give stimulation peripherally in the skin, it introduces this kind of a correction. <coughs> so, the conclusions by Lebet are the cortical activity due to sensory stimuli, uh, stimulus must persist for a minimum duration to produce conscious sensation and they, he calls it the neuronal adequacy. So, you need to have activity in the neuron for a minimum amount of time and you get minimum generate minimum activity in the brain, right, for that to become, enter your conscious awareness. And once the adequacy is achieved, the subjective timing of the experience is referred backwards, backwards in time, because brain knows through evolution, there is always this delay between the external stimulus coming from the external world and the subjective uh, event that it produces. Okay, so that is uh, some uh, interesting experiments about uh, subjective aspects of sensory stimulus, right. In the last uh, segment, we talked about how the stimulus is experienced in the, uh, until now in this segment we talked about when the stimulus is experienced and we saw some aberrations, very interesting aberrations. And now we will see similar aberrations which seem which will you know shatter our kind of intuitive beliefs about, uh, about 
or the motor side or how actions are performed. So we all, I mean even if you look at a textbook on neurology or neurophysiology, so they divide actions into voluntary and involuntary movements. For example, if you step on a pin and then you involuntarily by reflex, right, you withdraw your foot, that is called involuntary, you know, you, you do not, there is no conscious involvement in that kind of a response. Whereas, you know, you are sitting quietly and then suddenly you get up and go and drink some tea or something like that. So that is a completely internally driven, a voluntary movement, okay. So, um, so that is what is called generally free will and there is all the debates, you know, in the philosophical circles whether there is free will and all that. But if you just go by the popular understanding that you know, there is such a thing called free will, right. And uh, so how does free will work? So normally what you would think is your will or your, you know, your motivation or intention to move starts first and then somehow that gives rise to certain activity in the brain, neural activity in the brain. And uh, depending upon which part of the body you want to move, suppose you want to move your right hand. So then we know that that is controlled by the left brain, left motor cortex and then somehow activity appears there like magic almost and then from there it you know it uh, goes to the spinal cord and activates your hand. So how do exactly does free will uh, work? Now we would assume that even when there is sensory stimulus, between sensory stimulus and the motor response, there is some kind of a subject, a, a, a self, a kind of a conscious agency, an agent which inserts himself or you know herself between the sensory input and the motor output, right. And then this is what determines uh, whether you want to act or how you want to act and things like that. Okay, but uh, it is that is what you would assume, but there are patients in which this kind of interaction, this kind of a gating, uh, this kind of insertion of the conscious self it does not seem to be happening, okay. So it is not simply a question of decision making because in this ex the subjects studied by Francois Le Hermit, right, these people are slaves to the sensory world. So if you show them for example a pen, right, they would just pick it up and start writing on any surface. If you show them a comb, they will just pick it up and start combing their hair even though there is no need for it at that moment, they will just start doing it. Or if you give them a toothbrush, they will start brushing themselves immediately, okay. So if you or if you show them a bed, maybe they will just go and lie down on it, right. Even if it is inappro totally inappropriate for that context, I mean there are a lot of people and it is maybe daytime or something. So they are completely, their actions are completely driven by the external stimuli. There is no self or agency which inserts itself right between the sensory input and the motor output and decides whether to act and if so, what exactly should be the action. So you see this little cartoon picture in the bottom. We have discussed in our, uh, one of the early lectures on uh, organization of nervous system that between the sensory input and the motor output, there is a very high region of uh, the cortex, the prefrontal cortex, right, which performs decisions and all that. And it is here there is a damage in these subjects and uh, so they are not able to <coughs> they become slaves of the external stimuli. In fact, this condition is called environment dependency syndrome. Now, okay, but that does not happen normally. So, in normally in normal subjects, you know, we have the feeling that we have a will and then that, right, if you look at the normal account of how we think we move on our own, it goes something like this, right. The will first arises in the mind, you know, you have an intention, you have a thought, okay, I want to do something. And then actually, if you look at uh, the, the uh, functional imaging scans of people who are engaged in voluntary movement, that is, the subjects are asked to say, lift their finger on their own at a self-appointed time, appointed time. There is no stimulus which is telling them, okay, do it. They decide on their own and make a simple movement. And when that happens, people found that the first activity is seen in the supplementary motor area. And, and that happens bilaterally. The supplementary motor area is located more medially and it, this activity happens bilaterally. After that, the activity then slowly progresses to the M1, <coughs> to the contralateral side. So what begins as a bilateral activity? becomes unilateral, becomes actually contralateral, goes to the opposite side of, of the part of the body which is moved. And then the activity flows down towards spinal cord, towards to the hand and then the movement occurs. So the normal sequence of events that you would imagine is the first the conscious event, the event of will, right, when you want to, the intent to move. Then the brain's activity, whether it is SMA or primary motor or whatever, some kind of a, some activity, some event happening in the brain, then the actual movement. But uh, actually this uh, simplistic belief that we all carry with us all the time uh, and that is what our sense of self is based on, this simple belief seem to be shattered uh, by this elegant experiment by Gray Walter. So in this experiment, the subjects had electrodes implanted in the SMA, so they can stimulate the SMA. And then the subjects can actually press a button and then in front of them there is a screen and there is also a, there is a slide projector. <coughs> 
uh, we change the slide on the screen. So, what they were told is by pressing the button they can change the slide on the slide projector. Uh, that is what they were told, but actually it is a it is a lie. There is no connection between the button and the slide projector. So, what is actually happening is they are picking up electrical activity in the brain from the SMA and that activity whenever they see the activity there that means there is intention has begun and they use this activity to control uh, you know, a, a, a lever and a machine which will uh, activate the slide changer and then slide moves forward. Okay, so, they are kind of you know uh, in sense preempting what the subject is wanting to do. So, the subject keeps pressing and then uh, you know the, this, the it, he sees the slide moving. So, normally if you think that the sense of will is born first the subject will be conscious about the intent first and then would observe this. So, would uh, observe the slide moving, but actually what happened was the side projector seems to be seems to seems to be anticipating their intentions and moved even before the subjects have intended not even before pressing the subjects just barely feel right actually even before they had the intention the slide is already preempting their intention and moving ok. So, that means uh, your SMA activity began begins first and that activity is driving this hidden machinery which is moving the slide projector right and making it change and then this person simply presses the button right after the activity has started in the brain, but that has no connection to the real uh, change in slide. So, they feel that uh, the, 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 the actually the it is as though the slide changer knows their mind and responding even before they actually think of changing the slides ok. So, the subjects became aware of their intent a bit late and that is what it looks like you know let us look at it more closely. So, normally whenever we do things on our own by willed action by what is called voluntary activity you would you know there are three events which take place the will the, ar the arisal, arising of the will the will event and the motor cortical activity activity in the brain and then the actual movement. So, the normal sequence in which these three events uh, will or will be thought to occur that is what we would believe is will first motor cortical activity later and then the actual movement. But uh, so, uh, so, whereas uh, Benjamin Libet has done an experiment to show that this sequence is not quite correct ok. To understand the experiment we have to mention that uh, there is this thing called readiness potential. So, like I said uh, whenever you move things right on your own voluntarily the brain's activity that is observed when you perform voluntary action is quite different from the brain's activity when you perform say stimulus driven action. So, suppose somebody is will ask you to move your hand and then immediately when you see the stimulus you move the finger right that activity the brain's activity that you see say in SMA and motor cortex is quite different from what you see when you are when you are moving your hand at your own uh, self appointed moment. So, what exactly happens? So, thing is in when, when you in case of voluntary movement when you decide to move on your own brain starts preparing for that event well in advance so almost like you know uh, close to a second or you know more than half a second before the event. So, in this uh, graph in the, the you see some graphs on the right side. So, you see the third graph from the bottom right that is uh, mid parietal. So, this is close to the midline. So, here you see that this activity is building up. Uh, almost once uh, more than 0.5 seconds before 0. 0 is the time when the movement has occurred ok. So, so it is well in advance uh, the movement is uh, you know the activity is building up in the brain. So, this is called motor preparation that means brain is preparing for movement preparing getting ready to move ok or getting charged up to move and this takes a long time in case of a voluntary movement whereas if you are just responding to a stimuli that happens much quicker you do not need that happens maybe uh, 100 milliseconds or even less than that. Okay. So, this is called the Bereitschaft's potential in German and a familiar English word for that is readiness potential basically it, it conveys that the brain is getting ready to move right uh, in the form of this kind of a voltage. So, now uh, Benjamin Leibert's experiment uh, looks at the, this kind of measurements from brains when the subject, subjects are engaged in uh, voluntary movement. So, like I said the BP or RP as a potential is called represents C the motor cortical activity. Then you can measure the movement by hooking up uh, you know the person with electrodes. So, that uh, the electrodes pick up the muscle activity the muscular activity then that uh, that kind of measurement is called electromyogram myo you know, denotes muscle. So, that measures electrical activity in the muscle and that event represents him which is actual movement. Now, there is a third event which is willed action that is when does the will event occur. So, there are three events that you have to uh, measure and compare them 
So, again the like before the build action event or will event is measured by using this kind of a moving dot uh, arrangement. So, the normal order the intuitive order which you would expect is will first motor cortical activity later and then actual movement, but what Leibovitz experiment show has shown is motor cortical activity first and then will and then actual movement. In fact, you can see that that is pretty much what is happening in grey waters experiment. So, there the motor cortical activity started first and the subjects felt that you know they are already preempted. I mean they were they were still thinking about it already the slide has moved. Only thing is in grey waters experiment they, they have not actually measured the time at which the will occurs, but that is what they have done in the uh, Benjamin Leibet experiments. But basically the, the qualitative result is same in both cases. Will the time of will event is happens later after the motor cortical activity. So, what does it mean? It basically tears down that uh, you know the idea that simple belief on which our lives are based that we are the bosses. I mean, so, there are certain things which you do by coercion, somebody asks you to do and you do it, but there are such certain things that you do on your own, but even in those things where apparently you are doing completely on your own voluntarily, right? It is as though brain decides to move and do it. And then you are informed, you the conscious self is informed by the way. So, it is like brain initiates the action all by itself and is just courteous enough to inform you by the by the way, right, about the proceedings that were initiated right under the nose of the conscious self. It is like you know, brain decides to move your hand and then it says, you know, by the by, right, I am moving your hand, I just want to inform you, right, but you have no control over it. So, that is a bit scary, but this is what the experiment uh, seems to indicate. <coughs> So, uh, Gerald Edelman, a Nobel laureate, right, uh, who has dealt with the question of consciousness, uh, so talks about that there are two realms, the C and the C prime. C is the world of conscious experience and its contents. You know what you feel, what you experience, you know when you experience, and how intensely you experience, and all this, all the contents of the subjective world. You know your emotions and moods and all that. I mean, it's difficult to quantify all that. It's difficult to measure them, put numbers on them. But there is, they exist, I and mean, we know that. Right, and then there is uh, the objective world of stimuli. You know, you have lights and you know uh, pressures and the sounds and all these things that you can measure and quantify. Right, measure with your you know, experimental equipment. Now the question is, the big question in consciousness research is, how are these two worlds related? Right, if I give a stimulus and I know what stimulus it is, I, I show a color blue, which I know is definitely blue because the wavelength that comes from it can be measured by a device, and I know it's that wavelength is corresponds to blue. But when you show it to a person in certain conditions, the person might think it is I don't know, green or something like that. So, the, so there can be a discrepancy between what is out there in the world and what is experienced in, in there, right in the, in the in your conscious self. So, linking these two and working out the relationships and all the variability and richness of this relationship is a big challenge in the, in the conscious research uh, domain right now. So, Dahane and co workers have done these interesting masking studies. So, where they were shown some visual for some words visually. So, they were shown very briefly and then after that the word is masked. So, they would not know what the word the world is because uh, you know it is presented for a brief time. So, we know that <laughs> there is thing called neuronal adequacy, but unless stimulus is presented for a very long time, sufficiently long time, it does not enter your awareness. So, in this case the words are present for a short time and then they are masked by some other stimulus which covers it up. So, when they do that you know they have found that there is activity in the primary visual cortex. So, brain is responding to it, but the subject does not is not aware of it. Okay. So, so you see already the kind of discrepancy between brain's responses and the subjective subject's responses. But when the words are presented without mass for a longer time, right, then subjects are conscious of it. But there is a very interesting difference between the kind of brain's responses that are seen in these both cases. In the first case, when the ma masking stimuli is presented, the activity was confined to the primary visual cortex, so basic lower sensory areas. But when the activity, uh, when the word was unmasked and presented for a longer time, the subject became conscious, and there is wide, much wider spread activity in the visual parietal and even frontal areas. That means, can we say that unless uh, the higher areas of the brain's hierarchy, these are parietal on the input side and the prefrontal on the on the motor or executive side, unless these areas are involved. Uh, right in the response to stimulus in the brain's responses to stimulus, the subject doesn't get any awareness of it. Right, brain responds. You can measure those responses and everything using all sorts of you know experimental equipment, but the subject is not uh, aware of that. So, using uh, based on these kinds of studies, uh, you know Bernard Bars has proposed this global workspace theory, uh, 
basically what he proposes is that the large specialized networks right, uh, subconscious by themselves uh, might be working together to achieve awareness through synchronization. There is a very interesting theory proposed by uh, you know Tonin, Gilio, Tonini and uh, uh, Gerald Edelman. So, what they propose is that there is this tightly connected network of brain areas in the higher levels of the hierarchy right again between parietal and prefrontal and so on. They form a very tightly coupled network and they call it the dynamic core and the dynamics, this dynam dynamics of this core must be sufficiently complex and what we mean by complex I mean they are, they are able to define that mathematically using ideas from information theory, so from computer science information theory. And these theories have found some evidence in lot of data we have uh, from EEG, from people who are in different states of consciousness. So, for example, in, in the case of a, a subject undergoing a seizure, there is huge activity in the brain, but subject is actually unconscious while that is happening. So, you can show that uh, the activity in this case uh, has actually, it has high amplitude, but has a low complexity of dynamics according to theories of uh, Torini and Edelman. Then there are also physical theories of consciousness. So, for example, Susan Pocket and you know John Doe, John Joe McFadden have proposed that the electromagnetic field generated by neural activity that is a substrate for consciousness and then uh, synchronized activity uh, in this EM field right is, is a correlate for consciousness. So, so it is not just a signal, but also looking at uh, the EM field and then the, then the, some other question is uh, do you have to modify the Maxwell equations as you study in electrical engineering to study uh, the field propagation in the, in the brain. So, these are all open questions. I had one more question that arises is when you start looking at uh, physical theories of brain is that you know in conscious ex consciousness exp experiments you see a lot of distortions of space and time right your event in the external world is something the time duration in the internal world is something else right and then your measurement of space is something in the external world and something else in the internal world. So, normally we take these distortions as a kind of aberration we take the physical world as the standard right as a, as a absolute reference and with respect to that we take the the response of the brain with the we take the uh, interpretation of the subjective self as some kind of an aberration you know some kind of a variable thing which has to be constantly checked and uh, validated and calibrated uh, with respect to what we know as the time and space in physics. But maybe in future right these aberrations cannot be taken as simply aberrations, but you have to deal with it. So, then you have to have a, even a physical theory of consciousness which uh, can you know uh, uh, integrate these aberrations that are found in the conscious experience uh, domain research and also that aberration and the kind of theories of space and time as are as are formulated in physics. So, maybe we in future we will develop a more comprehensive theory of consciousness uh, which kind of uh, includes our understanding of space and time as it uh, as, as it uh, occurs in physics. So, so right so right now the situation is there are wide variety of brilliant theories and in fact there are a lot of theories that uh, originate from quantum mechanics and there is now, pe people talk about quantum gravity, microtubules in neurons and how they are related to consciousness and so on. But there is no consensus uh, you know in all these theories and there are different pockets of uh, theories and which is the situation with most uh, questions in the brain and lots of theories without any consensus. So, it is obviously a very hard problem and a lot more progress uh, has to happen. But if that progress uh, can happen and if we can really understand consciousness from a scientific point of view, I mean not like how the religious people have been discussing it or how a psychologist I have been talking about, but purely from a scientific point of view um, by the standards of an you know, empirical and objective science, if you can have a theory of consciousness in future I and mean, that will probably make a major impact right on human society and civilization. Thank you.